Hi, today we're going to be looking at the GVM H3 soldering station and this is a JVC style system and it's called the 3-in-1 not because it's got three channels or can drive three handles simultaneously but just because it has three hand pieces with it. So the most common types of JVC handpiece, the 245, 210 and the little 115. Unfortunately I've not really come across a suitable alternative for the JVC 470 handpiece at the moment. But this is a all-in-one soldering station with a mains input and an 80 watt power supply in there. So with the largest, the T245 handpiece, we should be able to deliver a decent amount of power into a solder joint. And looking at the pricing, we're coming in somewhere around £100 delivered. So kind of similar pricing to the Ixon T3A and T3B soldering stations. In terms of what you get in the box, obviously you get the unit itself, you get three different sized JBC style hand pieces, you get a silicone pad should you wish to remove a hot cartridge from the soldering iron, you get three cartridges, although if I remember correctly there are some different packages available where you can pay a little bit more and I think you get nine cartridges, three of each different size. You get a mains cable and interestingly, normally when I pick a 220 volt or 230 volt model, you end up being shipped a European cable, but we actually got a UK cable here, so they actually took note of where it was being delivered to and sent the right type of cable. And then you also get an instruction manual and a little certificate. And interestingly, it says Sunshine on here as well as Relife. And if you watch my video from a few years ago, I think we did re review some flux paste from Relife, and these were pretty good, so uh, it's all from the same kind of family. So before we go any further, a quick word from our sponsor for this video, PCBWay, who as you know offer a variety of manufacturing services, including PCB manufacture from very low cost prototype boards through to professional HDI boards and FPC and rigid flex PCBs. PCBWay also offer some mechanical manufacturing services including CNC machining, 3D printing and sheet metal folding. And also there is the PCB Way community where you can either share your projects for other people to build or you can browse other people's projects and if they've uploaded all of the files onto there you can actually get PCB Way to manufacture the PCBs, the components onto the PCBs and even have any of the mechanical parts manufactured as well. So if you're interested in any of those services don't forget to visit PCBWay.com. So this unit is an all-in-one design, very similar to the JBC compact line stations, and it has very similar characteristics. Uh, on the front here, we've got a full-color TFT, 320 by 240 pixels. We've got three preset buttons, as well as a menu and the up-down button for navigating through the menu. And then on this side, we've got the cradle for holding the handpiece, and this clicks into, I think, about three different positions. Uh, we've got some brass wool in here and we've got a silicone anti-flick pad so that when you're cleaning the tip you don't flick solder everywhere. There's this section here which allows you to take a cartridge out of the handpiece without actually coming into contact with the cartridge itself. And then we've got a grey sponge pad at the bottom here which you can damp to clean the soldering tip should you wish to use that method. Uh, at the top here we've got four holes which you can store cartridges in and then on this side uh, there's a place where you can use this little cable tidy and this kind of hooks into here and keeps the cable up and out of the way. But I tend to find that that actually just gets in the way all the time. I don't tend to use those. On the back, we've got a IEC connector for the mains input and this is specifically a 230 volt model. And we've got a double pole power switch, the connector off to the soldering iron and a USB port. Now, from what I can gather, this is for firmware updates, but there's no information about this in the user manual. And as far as I can see, there hasn't been any release of firmware updates so far. There's also a 4mm banana jack for connecting to your ESD uh, equipment. Uh, there's nothing on this side. And then just on the bottom, some ventilation and a little bit of information about the unit. So 220 volts, 50, 60 hertz. Uh, and 80 watts output power. The unit is pretty weighty, so uh, we've obviously got a transformer in here. And in terms of the construction, it does feel fairly lightweight. I think it's relatively thin plastic, but pretty much what you would expect for the kind of price point. It does feel okay. Um, certainly not quite as nice as the JBC, uh, but it still feels pretty solid and fairly well put together. 
The three hand pieces are pretty typical for what you get for these Chinese clones of the JBC stations and potentially you could use a genuine JBC handle. You would need to change over the connector but potentially you could desolder these and put it on to your genuine JBC handle. But these are all fairly typical so the T245 is pretty much a clone of every other T245 hand piece that we've looked at. The T210 is slightly different. We don't normally see it with just the foam grip and you normally end up with a, a foam grip for the T245 that you can apply if you want to. But this one has this one fixed in place uh, for whatever reason. And then you get the tiny T115 with a really, really thin wire. Now this one's a lot thinner than the other two because there's only a limited amount of power that you can put into these little cartridges. And normally what happens is when it detects one of these hand pieces being plugged in, it either switches to the 12 volt tap on the transformer instead of the 24 volt tap, or it uses some kind of limited power profile so that you don't burn out the cartridge or the little cable. But this one's really nice and compact and really good for little SMD jobs. So I was just taking it apart and there's five screws at the bottom but not one where this foot is at the front and then when you remove the sponge pad there's actually a screw hole under here which I think is a bit silly really because you only have to be a bit careless with putting water on the sponge pad and spill it in here and it will go down the screw hole straight into the bottom of the soldering iron. Now you're not going to be pouring litres in but I don't know why they didn't put the final screw uh, in the bottom with all of the others. It seems a bit of a poor design, but let's have a look inside the unit. In the base of the unit, we've got the power control PCB, we've got the mains transformer, and then there's just the connectors on the back panel. So the one going to the iron that is connected with some fairly heavy gauge wires here, and also a USB connector that goes through this flat flex, and then just a few other wires um, that go from that soldering iron connector to this PCB. Now because the IEC connector has the mains switch built in, there's basically just the two AC wires going straight into the transformer. They've also earthed the transformer, even though I don't think you can touch this from the outside. And then let's have a look at the power PCB because we've got the two sets of secondaries coming into the PCB here. These are both fairly heavy gauge, so I wonder if we can switch the two uh, secondaries in series to get 24 volts for the T245. One of the windings for the transformer comes in and goes straight into this bridge rectifier into two electrolytic capacitors and then into a linear regulator so this is a 7805 for 5 volt supply and then we also get a supply here to a little switching regulator which I assume is a book regulator it looks like a standard uh, layout there for a book regulator and this is probably the 3.3 volt supply for the front panel. Then we've got a TL7660 charge pump here, which is a negative supply. And this quite clearly goes off to this IC here. Now this says C0S128 and then U4C. I didn't find any part number that matched that, but it does seem to have the footprint uh, of an op amp here. So I think given that the iron connector goes through this flexi here, uh, there's also the slightly heavier gauge for the actual connections to the heater, but it would make sense that this is for the thermocouple so that we get a nice analog output uh, straight to the front panel PCB. And then if we look just here, we've got this unusual component here. Now there's no markings on it, there's just a little um, crest or something at the top here. I'm not entirely sure what this is, I've never seen this footprint before. Then we've got one of these MagSense uh, current to voltage chips. So this can read an AC waveform uh, that is fed through here and then we get a 0 to 3.3 volt output. Uh, so an analog representation of the current that's going through this chip. And then we've got two N channel MOSFETs and these are connected in such a way that you can switch AC with it. And given that it's right next to the connector for the soldering iron then we can basically conclude that this is switching the AC AC waveform directly, so very similar to the genuine JVC. Rather than PWM pulses of a DC waveform, they're actually switching the AC here. This metal plate is attached to the top of the unit with four screws, and that reveals the front panel PCB. So we've obviously got the TFT on the top, as well as these tactile switches. And then if we remove the PCB, that reveals an extremely bare bones controller PCB. So the whole thing's powered by one of these Gehe processors. It's an ARM core 32 bit processor. Uh, and then we've got two kilobits of memory. So I think this is a 24C02 just here. 
we've got a linear regulator in A1173.3. So it looks like this is powered from the 5 volt supply. So I'm not 100% sure what that switcher is on the other board. Then we've got a buzzer. This one looks like it might be slightly annoying and loud. Uh, it's got the associated driver components here. We've got the driver for the backlight. Uh, and then a few, I think, protection devices here for the various outputs that go onto the other board. So really not much on this board whatsoever. Just the LCD, a controller, and some buttons. A common question is, is the tip of the Soldier 9 earthed? So let's test that. Connect it to the earth pin and connect it to the cartridge. And as you can see, that is a connection. Let's check if it's a direct connection or through some semiconductor device. And no, that is directly connected to mains earth. Let's take a look at the user interface. So let's turn it on. And we've got a nice colourful display, as you can see. And then we've got the kind of home screen. And this is while it's in sleep, so you can see the little moon there that's asleep. And in terms of setting it, so we can set the temperature of the iron through the three presets here. So these are kind of soft keys for what's going on on the bottom here. Or we can adjust the temperature with the up and down buttons in what looks like five degree steps. To go into the menu, we hold the menu button down. And then we've just got a very simple user interface. So again, the soft keys here. Sleep, we'll press enter. And at the moment, sleep is set to off. But if we turn that on, then this is basically a delay before it starts de-energizing the iron when it's placed into the cradle. So we can click back here. Then we've also got beep. And I normally turn that off. I think we press enter, move it across and click store. Then we can go back. Unit, so degrees C or degrees F, that's fine as it is. And then language, we've got either Chinese or English installed on here. Uh, we've also got a maximum temperature, so if it's used in a lab environment, people are terrible for setting these up at really high temperatures because they're having trouble with the solder joint. You can set a limit on that, and normally you wouldn't need anything higher than about 380 or 390, so that's often what's done. Uh, at the moment, this is set to 450 degrees C. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. We can also set a password so that you can't change any of the settings. We've got a calibration here. So it says set 330, and what we do is we place it on the calibrator, and if we're reading a slightly different number, we can put that number in here, and then it should recalibrate. And then we've got a factory reset. Uh, we've also got a section here for graphics, so we'll click Enter. And here we can have a look at the power being delivered and the temperature of the cartridge. And to go back, I think we press the menu button. So it turns out you press channel 1 here to go back to the main user interface. And then we've also got info here, so GPMH3, serial number, and presumably a version number either of the firmware or the hardware. And that's it for the user interface. And so when you take the handpiece out of the cradle, it starts heating up. Now I did notice it's a little bit slow to increase in temperature and you can see on the power meter that we're only reading just under 40 watts and this thing's supposed to be rated at 80. So I don't know if that's a limitation of the cartridge, we will try it with the genuine JVC shortly. But it does take a moment to reach it and then it seems to settle at about 30 watts or so oh, and then drops down to 6. So also I noticed the reading was wobbling all over the place for a moment and then it's sort of clamped to 3.30. If we hold it on the sponge, let's see what happens. So once it goes a bit too far away from the set point, it then shows the real reading. Then it heats up again. Wobbles around. And then clamps to that 3.30. So let's have a look at the calibration. See how close it is to 330 degrees. So 345, so about 14 or 15 degrees off. Let's see if the calibration works. So calibration, and then we go and press enter, I think it is, and we set this to 345, which is what it was reading there. Press store, and then we can go back.
clean the tip a bit. Okay, well it's way under now. Um, 30 degrees under, so it seems to have changed it by about 45 degrees, which doesn't entirely make sense. Let's try somewhere near the middle. Let's see what happens if we do that. 335. Well, that's kind of close enough. So, a genuine JBC cartridge this time. And again, we're limited to 40 watts, which is a little bit surprising. So, I know this cartridge is capable of the full power delivery because we've tested this many times. But this is really, really slow to heat up. So, it's struggling at just 40 watts. I'm not 100% sure why we've got that discrepancy in the specification. Let's try heating something up that has a bit of thermal mass, just in case this is some kind of cartridge protection or something just during heat up. But yeah, this does take a long time to get to the set point. I mean, this is quite a high uh, thermal capacity cartridge, but what we're looking at, we're looking at about 15 seconds or so to get up to 370. There we go, it's up to temperature. Let's see if we can heat this up. Well, you can see the temperature dropping and we're not putting any more than 37 watts into the cartridge. So, yeah, it looks like there is some discrepancy in the specifications here. This time we've got the tiny C115 handpiece connected and you can see that has been detected. It's changed the picture on the display. Now, if I remember correctly, this puts in the low tens of watts into these tiny cartridges. So let's have a look. about 25 watts and that did well what's happened there it overshot massively well I've let that cool down let's try it again and see if it does that weird overshoot again so we'll take the handpiece out and this time it didn't look like it did it but I'm not 100% trusting of that um, let's see if we can put any power down into a high thermal demand PCB and it is managing to melt a bit of solder on there, and it's putting that maximum sort of 24 watts in there. So I think that's probably software limited so that we don't burn out the cartridge. But yeah, I mean, we're putting out a decent amount of power in a tiny little cartridge there. Uh, pretty much ideal for some SMD work. So let's have a look at a bit of soldering, and then we'll just try the coin test with this and see how it works. One of the complaints about the Ixen stations is when you soldered something that was connected to mains earth, it threw off the temperature reading. Now this has a proper transformer in it, so as you can see, there is no effect there. 
Well, unfortunately, this unit isn't performing as expected. It's claimed to be an 80 watt soldering station, but I was not able to get more than 40 watts out of this system. I've tried a whole variety of different hand pieces and cartridges. Cartridges which definitely can deliver far more than that when I've tested them on other systems. So I'm pretty sure I haven't got a faulty unit. Generally, it's behaving correctly. It's just not able to put out more power than that 40 watt sort of limit. Now with the C115 handpiece where I was doing that through hole soldering that's typically the limit of what you can do with that little handpiece about 25 or 26 watts but then swapping it for the larger handpiece we're only getting about 13 or 14 watts more which just isn't enough for these types of systems and it takes forever to heat up you know it's 15 20 seconds even longer with the high thermal demand cartridges so yeah it's just really not living up to its claims and I would hesitate to recommend this unit unless you only wanted to use it with the little C115 handpiece or if you're really limited to just basic through-hole soldering but I think there are better soldering stations out there for your money. Anyway if you do want to take a look at the AliExpress listing for this unit I will put a link in the description down below. Don't forget to visit our sponsor for this video PCBWay who without their support I wouldn't be able to provide you with all of these types of videos. But anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. If you've got any thoughts and comments about the system leave them in the comments section down below. And until next time, thanks for watching.